Stupid. I'm Megan Stevens from eatbeautiful.net and today we are finishing a two-part series. So it's part two of a two-part series. Um, wonderful. Someone says that they had uh, smashed potatoes this morning. So um, resistant starch, great. And that is the topic today, prebiotics and resistant starch. And we're going to be talking today about specific forms of prebiotics and resistant starch and um, basically how to get them into your diet easily, what foods are delicious and easily accessible. So I'm not gonna be listing all prebiotic foods or all foods that contain resistant starch, but most of them, and specifically the ones that I think are really accessible and fun to get into our diets. Um, if you are interested in last week's um, video, we talked last week on the Periscope about um, why prebiotics are valuable and how they produce T cells and why T cells are important. If you're interested in that video, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Megan Stevens, and um, watch the prebiotic periscope video there for a recap. So today, though, we're going to specifically focus on foods and which foods contain prebiotics, large amounts of prebiotics. Because just as with so many other nutritional assets, when we look at foods and their profiles, there are actually a lot of foods that contain some level of prebiotics, um, even wheat pasta. But we want to talk today about the ones that are the easiest to digest or um, the easiest to get in your body. If you do want to do wheat pasta, then I suggest you do sprouted wheat um, or white pasta so it's um, more easily digested. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to first look at prebiotic foods and then specifically resistant starch prebiotic foods because they're a little different from one another. Um, the first prebiotic I'm going to talk about um, is green plantains and bananas. And um, you might ask, how are you going to get green plantains or bananas into your diet? There are people who put them into smoothies. Um, they are, of course, very tanniny and not pleasant. Another way to get them into one's diet is to buy um, flour. You can buy green banana flour off of Amazon. And um, you can put that in smoothies, and that's easy and no big deal. So a lot of what we're doing here is we're looking at, well, what does your diet already look like? Are you a family that eats lots of smoothies? Is that a way for you to quickly just throw a tablespoon in and you're good to go? For those of you who eat a lot of smoothies, that's going to be a no work method. It's not expensive. So I definitely recommend that. Um, if you're someone that really likes to cook and bake and you want to have baked goods on hand, um, I have some carob brownie bites on my site that are made with green plantains. You do need a dehydrator, but that's a really good route to go. Is My kids love those, is to make basically cookies that get made in the dehydrator, and that allows the plantains to stay raw. So if you're someone that wants cookies, that route. Um, the next item that is prebiotic, the next prebiotic food is asparagus. Now the quirkiness about the asparagus topic is that the asparagus needs to be raw. And because most of us don't eat asparagus raw, nor should we because it's somewhat indigestible, um, the best way to get raw asparagus is actually to ferment it. Um, and March 22nd, so this month, on Traditional Cooking School, I have a post coming out on this topic, and there will be a link to a spring vegetable um, roundup, basically, where there's like six different recipes for fermenting asparagus. And you can also just go to Ganalfglins.com com or traditionalcookingschool.com and um, type in spring vegetables or fermented asparagus and it maybe and probably will come up that way as well. So fermented asparagus sounds delicious, right? That would be a really fun ferment to do and to have on hand. And then now you know that you'll be getting prebiotics by doing that. And again, the foods I'm mentioning today are the ones that are really high in prebiotics. So that would be a great source um, and an easy way to just put a few on top of your salad every night. And um, spring is coming, so asparagus is soon in season. Thank you for all the hearts, by the way. The next one, I'm going to... Um, turn my camera down. I want to show you these babies. Um, these are Jerusalem artichokes, and I think it's easy for people to say, Jerusalem artichokes, I, what are those? I don't have time for those. Oh, wonderful. Someone says they just fermented asparagus with lemongrass. That sounds amazing. So delicious. Yay, thank you for sharing. Um, but Jerusalem artichokes are actually really fun, and a lot of them, a lot of us can get them easily at health food stores. They're just in the produce section. A lot of times they're sitting in a little bowl of water. Um, they're very easily accessible, and they're really very little work at all. So I'm going to just turn this down so you can see my Jerusalem artichokes. There they are. 
And um, I want to show you a couple ways to do them. So I've got a peeler here. They are a little bit like a little potato. Um, even in flavor, when you eat them raw, they are a little bit starchy and a little bit mild. And it tastes a little like a combination between um, potato and maybe jicama. So I wouldn't say that all by themselves they're like, oh, so delicious. So it's more a matter of if you like, you know, fun and unusual foods. Okay, after you've peeled, it doesn't have to be peeled all the way. Then you basically can cut slices. So we use these as dippers, like you could serve this with any favorite dip that you have. Comment here. Yep, the roots, great. Um, so you could you can have little dippers like this. You can slice them more thinly if you want to. Um, you could also do like this, like a thick matchstick and put them on top of a salad or even tinier. If you like chopped salads, which we do, you can cut them pretty small and put a bunch of them on top of a salad. And then they're just kind of a crunchy, fun novelty to have um, with your salad. Now you can roast these, they're really nice. They're also really nice um, simmered in bone broth and pureed as part of a soup base. You do lose some of the prebiotics when they're not raw. Um, if you're getting other sources of prebiotics, that's fine. You, you know, it doesn't have to be this staunch thing where you have to eat them raw. So if you enjoy them cooked, they are really nice and you could experiment with them that way as well. So if you're someone that likes variety and you're gonna be pulling in all different kinds of prebiotic foods, then I recommend these. I think they're fun and they're yummy. When you cook them, the um, artichoke flavor comes out more, so that's where they get their name. They taste um, somewhat of potatoes and somewhat of artichoke hearts, which is good, right? That's a huge bonus. Most of us love artichokes. Okay, the next two to mention are um, dandelion root and chicory root. Um, so if you're someone that likes herbal coffee, this is a great and easy way. Again, every single morning, if you enjoy herbal coffee, you are getting prebiotics. So I recommend that. Um, they can be raw or roasted, the dandelion and chicory root. Um, and then dandelion greens are also an excellent source of prebiotics. Um, with dandelion greens, um, it's recommended raw, but um, of course with leafy greens, we have to be a little bit careful with oxalates and those kinds of issues. So for digestibility, I recommend just a quick saute or a quick blanch, just putting them in at the end of a soup or that kind of thing. Um, and they're gonna still have a lot of prebiotics that way, just lightly cooked. Um, and then also fermenting them is a great way to keep them raw. So chopping them up with any other ferment of sauerkraut um, or fermented vegetables, chop up dandelion greens, throw them in there, let them ferment, and your sauerkraut is going to be full of prebiotics. So again, pretty exciting. Um, I love this kind of cooking because you know the nutrition you're getting and it makes it more fun. And also, of course, dandelion greens, you can go out and forage in your own yard. The next three kind of go together. They are um, onions, leeks, and garlic. All three of them have their highest prebiotic content when they're raw. However, again, most of us don't eat those foods raw, certainly not leeks, um, but a light cooking is absolutely fine. So um, for instance, on the GAPS diet, if someone were on the GAPS diet and they were used to cooking their vegetables forever, or a gourmet who loves caramelized onions, those are not gonna be full of prebiotics. But if you just lightly cook, or if you're someone that likes really thinly sliced raw onion on your sandwich or on a salad, those are gonna be full of prebiotics. And for those of you who do enjoy raw garlic, again, full of prebiotics. Um, and then the last one to mention in this category is apple cider vinegar. It not only has prebiotic qualities, but it also helps to assist the digestion um, of resistant starch into butyrate, which is a lot of what we talked about last week. So it's kind of a helper in addition to having prebiotic qualities. Um, and as you know, apple cider vinegar is just a superfood. It has so many qualities. So now you know one more. It's a prebiotic food. Okay, let's phase into resistant starches. Now there's different kinds and classifications of resistant starches, and I'm gonna focus mostly on what we call RS3, retrograded starches, the ones that are cooked and then cooled. Um, so the first three I'm gonna talk about are beans, rice, and potatoes. So um, again, with the beans or rice, you either wanna make sure that they're soaked properly um, so that they're more digestible, or with rice, it's perfectly okay to use white rice. Um, and that's sort of its own complex conversation in and of itself, but I do advocate for white rice. Jasmine rice is very nice. Um, so with these three, you cook, the legume or the rice or the potatoes and then you cool them completely so even like an overnight refrigeration um, and then what happens is the starch becomes retrograded 
or resistant because of the cooling process. Um, and this excites the cook because there's so many options um, when you cook and cool foods. In one sense, it seems awkward and inconvenient, but in another sense, if you like batch cooking, it can be a wonderful way to get things done ahead of time. Um, and with something like the smashed potatoes recipe that I put on my blog last week, um, it adds to the texture and the crispiness you get off the potato as well. So as far as beans go, of course you could make a bean salad, but you can also reheat these, and that's probably one of the most important things to mention. Do we soak the rice before cooking? Um, with a brown rice, yes. With white rice, you don't need to. Good question. Um, so let's see. So with um, with beans, um, so the bean salad, sorry, I lost my train of thought briefly. You're, you're welcome. Um, so beans, okay, so you can do a bean soup. You could do refried beans. And the point is, yes, let them cool completely and then heat them back up. And hopefully you've helped yourself out. Hopefully you've cooked something ahead of time. And then when it's time for mealtime, it's just that much faster. Um, or if you make a huge batch of bean soup, serve it to your family one time, the rest goes in the refrigerator or the freezer. Know that every single time you have leftovers after that first eating, you will have resistant starch in your beans. So very convenient with rice, sushi rice um, has resistant starch, rice salad, yes, but you can also cook rice and reheat it. So like fried rice is going to have resistant starch if you let it cool first. Um, parboiled rice, I'm not familiar with, is that like um, Uncle Ben's, is that like a, you'll have to, um, yes, resistant starch is a good thing. Um, you, Hannah, you may have missed last week's, so if you want, you can go back and um, watch that first video on YouTube under Megan Stevens, and I talk all about resistant starch and that it's a form of a prebiotic, and that yes, it is very good for our colon health as well as to fight inflammation. There's a lot of good stuff happening, um, and you're welcome. Whoever asked the parboiled rice, I'm just not super familiar, but I have a feeling that means like Uncle Ben's, like it's cooked and then it's dehydrated and then it's instant. Does that mean it's basically instant rice? So I'll wait for you to answer that question. Um, but anyways, anytime rice is cooked and cooled and then eaten cold or reheated, then it contains resistant starch. Um, and then for potatoes, um, Wardy says, I think so, yes. Okay, so the answer with parboiled rice is yes. Um, it seems to me it would have been cooked, cooled, dehydrated, and then, okay, she says yes. So yes, parboiled rice is resistant starch, so even Uncle Ben's would have resistant starch. Uncle Ben's is the only brand I can think of, but yeah, definitely. Um, so then potatoes, like I said, if you go to eatbeautiful.net, my post, um, my blog recipe last week was called smashed potatoes, where I boil the potatoes in water, I let them cool, um, I put them in the fridge, and then they can go for like six hours or overnight, and then when you're ready to serve them, you just push the back of an offset spatula down on each potato, it completely smashes. You're welcome. Um, and then you roast them in the oven and they get crispy. You cook them in quite a bit of fat. They get crispy and delicious. And I love this with like Yukon Golds or new potatoes, red potatoes, it's the smaller varieties. Um, so it's super yummy. It's super convenient because you've got cooked potatoes ready for you in the, oven, in the fridge whenever you're ready to bake them. So almost no work. Um, and then for people who love hash browns, this method is also great. Cooking, putting in the fridge, um, and then you can grate. I don't remember if it's better to grate before or after refrigeration because I don't make hash browns that often. We've just been on the GAPS diet for so long. But you hash brown experts will know. Um, but I do think that by putting um, potatoes in the fridge, you get a crispier potato. So I think that's actually a hash brown method. Anyway, so that's how to do it with potatoes. Okay, on to the next one. The next resistant starch food I wanna talk about is cassava flour. Am I still on GAPS? Our family is actually phasing off of GAPS. We've been on it for five years. And one thing I talked about last week in that YouTube video or Periscope is that one of the things that made us realize we needed to get off of GAPS, it had been fabulous for us, but we needed to begin to phase off, was that our bodies didn't have enough prebiotic foods. And introducing cassava flour, actually it's great timing for your question, reintroducing um, resistant starches in the form of cassava flour is actually what helped me um, get over a constipation issue that had happened while I was on GAPS. And so it turns out it's just really impo an important missing link on a diet that doesn't have um, a lot of prebiotics in it. So, okay, I'm gonna hold this up. I finally, ta-da, I finally purchased this huge bulk cassava flour. I'd been buying the, 
I think one pound bags and then we do really enjoy it regularly I make muffins pretty often and pancakes and so I finally bought this 10 pound bag um, so cassava comes from the yucca root uh, yes, cassava is related to tapioca flour. Um, the difference is that tapioca is the starch that they get from it, and cassava is the entire root. Um, so I mentioned this, um, I think I mentioned this last week, and I think I've mentioned it in a post or two, but when I first reintroduced cassava flour, I actually felt guilty because I'd been starch-free for so long, it felt like I was cheating on gaps and that I would be sabotaging my diet. But in reality, what happened is it helped me to get better, and it actually helped my gut to be happier. Um, so while gaps is so fabulous for certain stages of healing, especially, obviously, the beginning stages of healing, at a certain point, we must make sure that we have prebiotics in our diet and resistant starches are one way to do that. And for me, my personal body, cassava flour is just really gentle. My body loves it. I have zero gas, although I hope that's not TMI, um, but I don't think it is because we're here talking about foods and healing. Um, and I just, I do really well with it. So it's my favorite prebiotic food. It's the one we use the most often. It does also need to be cooked and cooled. Um, so that's quirky for some people. Like I, when I make a muffin, I make sure it's cooled and then I eat it. Or if I make pancakes for the family, I actually let mine get cold. Now, I think there is some retrograded starch happening during the cooling process. So if you eat a warm pancake, maybe you're getting a little bit. Um, so again, that might not appeal to everyone to have a cold pancake. You might prefer the muffins. Um, and I mentioned last week, I did create a printable. Um, it's not accessible right away, but within about 24 hours, um, the link will be at my YouTube channel, Megan Stevens. You'll be able to click on the link and get a printable of everything we're talking about today. Um, all of the prebiotic foods, all the resistant starches, links to recipes, including cassava flour recipes, okay? So you can come back to my YouTube channel and print that out if you're interested. Okay, so that's cassava flour. Cooked and cooled is what causes the resistant starch to form. Um, the next one is tiger nuts and tiger nut flour. So um, I actually haven't munched on tiger nuts whole. You're welcome yet, and I'm looking forward to doing that. And the reason is I started with the flour, and I love baked goods, and so I've just been busy with the flour. But I think my next time, the next time I order, I am going to um, order the whole nuts. They're not actually nuts. They're tubers because I'm so intrigued by them. I've read quite a bit, and they sound delicious and fun. Um, they're, they're, this is a quirky one, actually, as far as resistant starch goes. You can derive RS2 from tiger nuts if you eat them raw. So if you want to eat raw tiger nuts, you actually take the whole nut or tuber and you soak them overnight 12 to 24 hours in filtered water, and then they're kind of crunchy chewy. Um, and that's how to get them the nutrition from them raw. So for people who like munchy foods and something that's crunchy chewy like popcorn, I think that's a really fun method. Um, if you have more time and like having baked goods in the house, I think the tiger nut flour is a really nice option and that's what we've done. I do have a quote brand muffin recipe on my blog using tiger nut flour. Whole, they are very crunchy, even when soaked in water, but very yummy. Thank you for adding that. I appreciate an insider tip or um, perspective. That's very helpful. Very crunchy. Okay. And so I've, I've read that people soak them for different amounts of time based on how crunchy they want them. Um, if you want them really crunchy, 12 hours. If you want them less crunchy, longer. Okay. So as far as this, if you make them into muffins, then it is RS3. So cooked, you're getting the resistant starch, but it needs to be cooked and fully cooled. So then in that case, the muffins would need to be cooled muffins to get the RS3 from tiger nuts. So you can go two routes with tiger nuts. Okay. I have just two more to mention. Um, Oh, actually, the green banana flour I mentioned above. Okay, so raw green banana flour. And then the last one is sorghum flour. So for those of you who are gluten-free, this might be a fun option for you. I know when I was doing gluten-free, I loved sorghum flour. For me, it was the most similar to wheat flour with baking. It gives an incredibly good cakey texture to muffins and cakes and baked goods in general. Um, it does need to be cooked and cooled, so in this case, baked and cooled. Um, if you go to traditionalcookingschool.com, I have a really good gluten-free sourdough donut recipe that uses sorghum flour, but I'm sure you also can come up with 
other recipes, um, or you may have some. So sorghum flour is an excellent gluten-free um, flour. And if you're not gluten-free or grain-free, all of these can still be part of your diet. Just, you know, we don't have to be staunch, and I'm sure you're not. If you're not staunch and don't need to be, we can borrow from different worlds and learn. And although a lot of these are sort of paleo, we can tag them as that. It's really all about wellness and what makes our guts happy and healthy. Um, so I classify a lot of my recipes as gaps, traditional, paleo. That's just so I can reach the people who need to receive my recipes. But in reality, a lot of us can't fit into one category. We're just learning, you know, from whom we can learn. And really the paleo functional medical practitioners have been on the forefront of the research about prebiotics and resistant starch. And so they have been a great um, resource for finding information as I've researched all of this. Okay, in my printable, if you go get that, I'm going to be sharing the Cara Brownie Bites recipe, smashed potatoes, tiger nut bran muffins, um, spiced taco spiced resistant starch crackers, which are made with green plantains or curried crackers. I have a chocolate eclair cake that um, is made with cassava flour. Yes, someone asks, is cassava flour considered gluten-free? It is very much so, and it's also grain-free, so it's a paleo product, um, and it can be used for those phasing off of gaps. It's too starchy for main gaps diet. Um, and then one of my favorite recipes of all time is the butternut squash muffins that are on my blog. They are so good. They're super cakey and yummy. Um, just a great texture, and those are full of cassava flour, so that's a fun one. And then um, on ganalfglinth.com, I have a green plantain cracker recipe, which I highly recommend. My kids love it. Great to have cheese and crackers or meat and crackers, um, so that's a really fun one. On um, my little printout, I will also have links to a couple posts that I've written, um, one on my blog, eatbeautiful.net, and one that's going to be published coming up here on March 22nd um, on um, Traditional Cooking School about prebiotics. Okay, there's one more topic I want to mention real quick before we close up, and that is how to decide which um, prebiotic foods work best for you. Um, part of this is trial and error, okay? So some you, you might just be drawn to one or more of these foods, like, yeah, Jerusalem artichokes look fun for my salad, or no, I'll never do those, but the banana flour looks great. We make smoothies all the time. Great. But realize that while all of these foods have prebiotic qualities, they are whole foods in and of themselves, and as such, they carry with them other components and may have allergy-related issues for for you depending on what your body is doing. Um, so an example of that is a lot of these foods contain um, inulin, and I want to just read to you which ones. Um, inulin is a prebiotic carbohydrate, and it's found in wheat, onions, bananas, garlic, asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes, and chicory. Um, but the interesting thing is inulin is also high FODMAP. So if you are prone to bloating or you know you're sensitive to FODMAP foods, which are basically foods that ferment in the gut and cause bloating um, and then gas, if you struggle with that issue, you may do well with prebiotic foods that do not contain inulin. And so you may do better with, for instance, cassava flour. So when you're trying to figure out which prebiotic foods to incorporate, just be aware that if one doesn't work for you, one of them causes gas or bloating, that's okay. Try another one. And the flip side of that same coin is start with a small amount. Um, felt bloated after jicama. Great. So that's, um, and jicama is also um, in the potato family, which is a nightshade. So that can sometimes be a subtle issue with that food as well. Um, but with all of these, when we're introducing resistant starch for the first time, we don't want to inundate our bodies with huge amounts. So you want to start with a small amount. What's a small amount? Um, with cassava flour, it could be a teaspoon to a tablespoon to start out with in a baked good. So you could just add a little bit to a pancake type thing and then let it cool and see how you do. Um, and same with the smoothies, like with green banana flour, if you're adding it to a smoothie, start with a teaspoon per serving and see how everybody does. A lot of experts say that some gas is perfectly normal in the beginning, even up to two weeks worth of gas. Um, I found that with cassava flour, that just wasn't an issue. So, you know, just go slow and experiment. And if you find that you love one food and the gas never goes away, that's probably not a good food. Switch to a different source of prebiotics. Um, 
And then by trial and error, eventually you'll find the ones that work for you. Some of you will be able to eat any and all of these, which is great. So just experiment till you find the ones that work for you and your family members. And maybe you'll have a few on hand if your family have different dietary needs, which is how our family is. We're all healing, and so we're all different bodies. So I have several sources of prebiotics in our house. My kids don't love um, Jerusalem artichokes, but I really like them. Um, so, you know, just have a few varieties on hand, and um, you can play around a little bit. Um, it brings up one other topic, which is there are sort of like convenience food, resistant starch foods or prebiotics like Bob's Red Mill, raw potato. Starch is highly recommended by a lot of um, paleo advocates. And I would say no on that one. We know that potatoes are a dirty dozen and Bob's um, potato starch is not organic. Um, and I'm just not a big fan of foods like that. It's not a whole food, causes a lot of gas for a lot of people. So I say stick with these other exciting options. Don't go that route. There are also supplement companies that um, have inulin in their prebiotic product. And I say again, stay away from you know those prebiotic supplements and stick with whole food because we have a lot of exciting options um, among the ones that I mentioned today. And I think they're the best sources. So that is all for today. Again, um, check my YouTube channel for the printable and um, thanks so much for joining me. I'm Megan Stevens with eatbeautiful.net and have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye!